Hello, welcome to the online review. My name is Carrie. I'm one of your TAs in case we haven't met. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to pull up the um, uh, review slides. These are on Learning Suite for you to, to see as well. Um, <clears throat> also, I still have a bit of a cough, so I apologize if I'm coughing through this. Super annoying, but it is what it is. Okay, so Learning Suite is where you're going to take the test. It's, we're going to, it's going to be proctored, so um, make sure you have a computer that has a camera. Make sure you're in an area where there's not a lot of people around you. Um, there's going to be some questions about people, historical sequence, some matching for DNC sections, multiple choice. It opens up on the 31st through the February 3rd um, till midnight. And if you want to review the slides on Learning Suite, because all of Brother Griffith's slides are on Learning Suite, it's a marvelous work and a wonder until the restoration of the priesthood. And there will be, um, the test is worth 25 points. So 5% of your grade. So nothing to freak out about, but you should definitely, um, you know, try, do your best. Good job watching this video, because we'll prepare you well. Um, so this may or may not be, but definitely is, Question 33 on the test. What instrument did Joseph Smith use to translate the Book of Mormon? Um, I'll tell you right now, the answer is D. Joseph Smith used several different instruments during the Book of Mormon translation. Now we put this question on here as an example to you um, of how a lot of questions on the test, there's like a most correct answer. Um, so just as you're going through the test, make sure you read through all of the options um, so you don't just like select one, but then um, there's like one that's more more correct. So just make sure you read all the questions and all the answers carefully, um, and you you should do good. Um, okay, so let's talk about some people who are going to be on the test. Obviously, Joseph Smith. Well, we're going to be talking about him throughout this whole review, so I'm not going to talk about him on this slide. Um, Moroni, you want to know who he is? He's the guy that buried the plates way back when. He appeared to Joseph multiple times um, over a course of a couple of, couple of years, um, multiple times that night when he appeared to Joseph while Joseph was um, in his house and he told him about the plates. Moroni even told Joseph to tell his father about um, his experience with Moroni and this work Joseph had to do. And then Moroni would appear when Joseph would go to the Hill Kamora every year. Um, so Moroni is obviously really important. Oliver Cowdery, <clears throat> he's just there for a lot of the beginning stuff, helping Joseph with Book of Mormon translation. He's Joseph's scribe for a lot of it. Um, Oliver is one of the three witnesses. Um, I think that's all you need to know about him. Um, I guess Oliver's where we get sections eight and nine of the Doctrine and Covenants, um, because he tried to do some translation and wasn't really successful. And so we have these sections to talk about the Spirit of Revelation, which are really cool. Um, Martin Harris. Martin Harris, he, um, well, famously known for losing the 116 pages, obviously, um, but he also was great. He mortgaged his farm to pay, like, pretty much the whole or majority majority of um, the printing of the Book of Mormon, so that was really awesome. Um, Martin Harris, he was also one of the three witnesses. Um, yeah. Emma Smith is Joseph's wife. She was his scribe for a little bit, but um, not not super super long. Um, Mary Elizabeth Rollins, we'll talk more about her later, but she's the one who, she saved the Book of Commandments, which was the name for the Doctrine and Covenants at that time, from the printing press that was being destroyed by a mob. So she grabbed the pages um, with her sister. They ran out to the cornfield and hid there. Um, Lucy Max Smith, um, she is Joseph's mother, and um, because of her, we have a lot of information about Joseph's childhood and early life through her journals, um, so that's something that's really important to know. Joseph Smith Sr., um, this is Joseph's father, really supportive, awesome guy. Like I said, Moroni commanded Joseph to tell his father about his vision, um, and Joseph Smith Sr. was actually the first patriarch of the church, which is cool. Um, let's see, Orson Pratt, so Orson Pratt was the one who, um, this is like after Joseph died, he, 
organized the Doctrine and Covenants into sections and he added 25 new sections. Um, those weren't like, so the new sections he added were existing revelations that Joseph Smith had, but they just weren't in the Doctrine and Covenants at that point. But he was like, these are great. They should be in the Doctrine and Covenants. So he's the one that did that. Um, David Whitmer, he was one of the, th the three witnesses. Um, he leaves the church, but unlike the other two, he never comes back, but he never denies his testimony, which is awesome. Um, yeah. And John Whitmer, John Whitmer, he was the first church historian. And I think that's all you need to know about John Whitmer. Okay. Um, so you don't need to know these dates. You'll never have to know dates on the test, but you will want to have a general idea of like important events that happened in these time periods. Um, so for example, if the test was like, when was the first vision? You could select beginnings, right? That happened at the beginnings. Um, so we've only like, at this point in the class, only talked about the beginnings. So um, I'm gonna give you a few other things that happened in these other time periods so you can be prepared for the test um, if it asks about other stuff. So in the beginnings, um, obviously the first vision happens. Um, Joseph marries Emma Smith. Um, priesthood is restored. Joseph and Oliver work on the translation of the Book of Mormon at this time. Um, I think that's it. You need to know two church centers. So this is when the saints are in Ohio and Missouri. This is when Kirtland, Ohio Temple is dedicated. Um, uh, what else? I think that's it. Nauvoo. Um, this is where Joseph is martyred. Um, this is where baptisms for the dead are introduced. This is where um, plural marriage as a whole is introduced to the church. Um, we, like Joseph had received a relation about plural, plural marriage before then, but it's like introduced to the church as a whole at that time period. Um, Nauvoo, this is when Joseph announces he's gonna run for president of the United States, which I, that's not on the test, but fun fact, we'll learn about that later. Um, yeah, that's it. Church in the West. Um, Church in the West, we talked about in class how this is the time when we got a lot of interviews of people who were involved in the church, like from the beginnings of the two church centers in Nauvoo. So after things settled down, after the saints came across the plains there in the West, um, that's where we get a lot of these interviews um, from. And expansion, this is when the church starts saying, you know, don't come to us, go to your local church buildings or local temples because up until this point the missionaries would go out and say like come to Zion um, but during expansion they're like no stay where you are and um, meet with your local congregations. Um, worldwide church um, in class we talked about official declaration number two um, which lifted the ban of the priesthood um, so that was that happened during the worldwide church. Name that section if you just memorize this slide, you'll do great because there's five questions that ask about which section is what and just, yeah, memorize the slide and you'll get those five points. Um, there will probably be a question asking about the sequence of these events. So look over the slide, make sure you understand this timeline, the first vision, then the priesthood is restored, then the Book of Mormon comes forth. forth law of consecration is given, and so forth. Um, if these are all on the test, make sure you can put them in order. Okay. <clears throat> Core doctrine, supporting teachings, policy, and esoteric. So um, we're not going to try and trick you on the test. There's not going to be a question like baptism. Is it core supporting policy? Like, we're not going to do that. Um, just make sure you understand, you know, a definition of what these things are. Um, so, for example, Brother Griffiths talked about baptism being a core doctrine. So a supporting teaching might be um, baptisms for the dead, because it's just a logical extension of that core doctrine. Um, supporting teachings are obviously very important. Um, they don't change as much as policy teachings, but I guess they could change. Um, if we're going with the example of baptism, a policy teaching might be um, like who can witness a baptism, um, like who can be a witness that's changed even in our lifetime. Um, so those change often, can change often. Um, esoteric teachings are things that are true, but we just don't know a lot about them. So um, 
for example, Heavenly Mother, maybe. We know that we have a Heavenly Mother. Like, we know that's true. We believe it. But we just don't know a lot about her. Um, so if people are doing deep dives into Heavenly Mother, it's like those kind of an esoteric teaching. True, but just don't have a lot of info. Um, okay, so you should be good on that. Just make sure you can identify these four things and have a general idea of what they are. But there's not going to be like a trick question with an example or anything. Um, what is a good source of doctrine? So something that is current, correlated, and published. If you want to memorize CCP to help you remember on the test, that's great. Um, so I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, something that's current, meaning like obviously Joseph Smith said a lot of things back in his day that are very true that we still believe, but um, it's a good source of doctrine because prophets now still teach the same things that Joseph did then. So how current is it? How current is it has been taught? Um, correlated, does it correlate with other sources? Um, if one apostle or someone says one thing, might not be a great source of doctrine if no one else is talking about it. Um, and published, if something's on like the church website, that's great source of doctrine. And kind of switching gears to reliable historical source specifically. We have five things here. <coughs> um, is it a primary source? Um, we have primary sources of the first vision. So that's like great source, right? Because Joseph's writing, I saw God the Father and Jesus Christ, right? Um, contemporary account. Um, contemporary would mean like when was the account given of what happened. So if Joseph didn't talk about the um, first vision until, um, you know, like years later, which is true, actually, most of the accounts are given years later, but something to take into account when you're talking about something that happened in the past, like when are you hearing about it? Is the primary source recent or not? Um, intent and tone, does the author have some kind of bias, um, some kind of agenda? Relationship to other sources. Um, so for example, if we're talking about the first vision, um, Joseph talked about how um, there was like a religious excitement at the time where he lived. So can we look at other sources and do they also talk about there being religious excitement in the area? And they did, okay, that's great. So the great relationship to other sources and factual inference. Um, um, this is like, Checking the facts. So Joseph said he went to a grove of trees and prayed. So we can look back and be like, well, is there even a forest near his house? Oh, there is. There's there's a grove. So great. Factual inference. Um, <coughs> sorry. You will want to read over the slide a couple times and understand there are these two definitions of scripture we talked about in class. One given in Doctrine and Covenants and the other in the Bible Dictionary. Um, so just understand the, the main idea of both of these definitions so um, you can be able to identify those on the test. Um, oh, sorry. I don't know how relevant this slide is to the test, but we also talked about canon versus scripture, how the Songs of Solomon, like it's in our Bible, but we don't consider it to be like canonized scripture. Well, it's in our canon, but Joseph Smith was like, this isn't really the word of God, not very important. Um, but I don't think there's a question on the test about that. So let's just skip that. But something you do need to know is there are four main accounts of the first vision and you're gonna want to be able to identify them. So one of them, is the only account written partially in Joseph's hand, recorded at the time of Doctrine and Covenants 85. It was Joseph's first attempt to record his history, never published during Joseph's lifetime. So this one is the 1832 account. Um, it also really emphasized Joseph's sins being forgiven. <coughs> <clears throat> so um, yeah, 18, um, what did I just say? 1835, I mean, 1832, sorry. This is the 1832 account. Um, this one, known as the Wentworth Letter, <clears throat> this one emphasized talking about there being two personages that exactly resembled each other, printed with articles of faith. This one is the 1842 account, okay? 
Um, <clears throat> this one, which is canonized, focused on the vision as the rise and progression of the church. Um, it's in our scriptures. Missionaries quote this on the daily. This one is the 1838 account. 1838. And lastly, this would be the 1835 account. Um, Joseph um, <clears throat> gave this account. He's so written to Joshua, the Jewish minister. You might remember kind of a crazy story about him. He was like a murderer and um, was like claiming to be God or something. And Joseph was like, actually, I've met God and I've met Satan. Um, so kind of talks more about um, Satan's presence there. Um, so, yeah, just make sure you can get the main idea of the differences between those. Um, okay, there's a question on the test <coughs> where it asks, how does Christ feel about the creeds taught by men, something like that? And um, a lot of people get it wrong. That's why we have a slide here, because just know that the question on the test is asking about how Christ feels about the creeds, not necessarily the people who are teaching them. Because the people who are teaching them are like, it says something like, um, they're, they draw near unto me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. It says something like that. And so um, don't select that answer on the test. It's not it. Um, just what is Christ saying about the creeds themselves? And I think he says something along the lines of they are an abomination in my sight. So there you go. A little freebie question for you. Oh, interesting. Um, <clears throat> do prophets make mistakes? When are they acting as prophets? So prophets definitely make mistakes. We've learned about this in our class. Joseph makes lots of mistakes. Um, a big mistake, for example, would be losing the 116 pages. Um, but it's important to know that God will never allow his prophet to make a mistake that's big enough that will lead the church astray, right? So we can definitely put our faith and confidence in the prophet um even though they might make mistakes they will not lead us astray so we can know that um an example would be joseph f smith um, he said it is doubtful that man will ever be permitted to make any instrument or ship to travel through space and visit the moon or any distant planet and then well we did mankind obviously made that possible and so Joseph Fielding Smith is just like, well, I was wrong, wasn't I? So maybe in that instance, he was just giving like an opinion and not talking as the prophet. Um, so yeah, just important to know prophets are mortal men, um, but they definitely will not lead the church astray. So we can still put our faith in them. Seer stones. Seer stones um, were not uncommon in Joseph's day. Obviously they're uncommon now, but um, it would like not everyone had one necessarily, but if someone came to you and they were like, yo, my cousin has a seer stone that he uses all the time, you would be like, oh, that's cool. You know, like not everyone has one, but you're not shocked if someone does kind of thing. In general, folk magic was more common back then um, and people were just more comfortable with the idea. So um, this is a quote by Joseph Smith and you don't need to know it word for word, but if I were you, I'd read over it a couple of times so you understand the general idea from it. You should do that. All right. History of the Doctrine and Covenants. You don't need to know like this exact timeline necessarily or the years, but <coughs> we're just going to go over it briefly. So in 1832, at a conference held in Hiram, Ohio, church leaders decided to compile and publish Joseph, Joseph Smith's, wow, I cannot speak, Joseph Smith's revelations. Um, so Joseph over last period of time had been asking a lot of questions and receiving a lot of revelations and finally they were like we need to compile these um into one book so everyone can have access to them um they call it the book of commandments it's printed in missouri it's almost destroyed by a mob like we talked about mary elizabeth rollins who went and saved it um in 1835 the doctrine and covenants is published by the church with the lectures on faith and 102 sections so at this point, they rename it from the doc from the Book of Commandments to the Doctrine and Covenants. Doctrine, the word doctrine referring to the lectures on faith, and covenants referring to all the other revelations. Um, moving forward, um, Orson Pratt, he 
oversees the creation of the new edition. He adds those new sections, oh, 26 sections, um, that, again, he didn't just, like, write those up, but they were existing revelations that Joseph had had. Um, in the 20s, lectures on faith are removed. Official Declaration 1 is added, but even though lectures on faith is removed, they still keep the name the same, Doctrine and Covenants. Um, yeah. That's about it. You don't need to know the timeline, but it would be good to understand that it was called the, the Book of Commandments, and then when they added lectures on faith, they called it Doctrine and Covenants, Doctrine referring to the lectures on faith, Covenants referring to the Revelations, and then even after lectures on faith were taken out, still called Doctrine and Covenants to this day. So what is the Doctrine and Covenants, and why is it unique? Um, Doctrine and Covenants is really cool because um, it is from our time. Um, it's not a translation, unlike the Book of Mormon and the Bible. This one was just received in English. Um, it's a lot of Christ's word, and there's no storyline, right? It's just like Joseph had a question or someone else he knew had a question. Joseph would go to the Lord, and then he would receive an answer, and it would become like maybe a new section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, and in class, we talked about how the Doctrine and Covenants is not necessarily finished, but we can still be adding to it. Um, which diagram best represents the relationship of the different orders of the priesthood? I feel like I need to delete this slide. Don't stress out about this slide. Um, the answer is the one here, um, on the right with the big circle, Melchizedek and ironic and patriarchal and in the circle, um, because Melchizedek is just like the name given to God's power. It's like the banner that the others fall under, but um, I'm gonna change the slide. But what you need to know for the test is that these are the three priesthoods, priesthood orders that Joseph Smith talked about. All right, how do we approach challenging issues in church history? Um, there are two quotes here, one from President Russell and Russell Ballard and another one about from President Oaks, um, it would be a good idea to read over both of those quotes. Again, you don't need to worm, need them. Oh, I can't talk right now. You don't need to know them word for word, but you should get the main idea um, so that if it asks you on the test, what did President Oaks say about teaching difficult or about challenging issues in church history, you'll be like, oh, I know just of what he said. Okay. And um, this quote says, our foundation is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The authority of the holy priesthood is here, restored under the hands of those who received it directly from our Lord. The curtains have been parted, and the God of heaven and his beloved son have spoken to the boy prophet Joseph in opening this last and final dispensation. Our burden in going forward is tremendous, but our opportunity is glorious. President Gordon B. Hinckley. This quote is not on the test, but it's a great quote, and I hope you feel empowered and excited to keep learning about the restoration. You guys are going to do so good on this test. Um, please read over sections 1 and 13 again, because there may or may not be, but definitely are questions on those sections. So you guys are going to do awesome. Um, once the test opens, we can't really be answering a lot of questions. Um, but you'll do great and good luck.